Thank you, Greg. Okay. Well, well, delineating the range of the uh, coastal-tailed frog has uh, been an ongoing process that's uh, involved a countless number of biologists uh, for, gosh, uh, over a century, uh, actually almost 120 years. And actually some of the people in this room, actually quite a few working in research and industry, have contributed to this body of work. <clears throat> and distributional knowledge is uh, not only a central component to uh, understanding the ecology, evolution, biogeography of the species, it's also essential for conservation and management. Um, we can't protect a species unless we know where it is. And uh, we can't restore its habitat uh, if we don't know where source populations are that are nearby that can colonize it. Uh, dis dis uh, dis uh, uh, distributional limits uh, for species like amphibians um, are often dictated by abiotic factors such as climate, uh, temperature, precipitation, um, <clears throat> but they may also uh, be partially dictated by how species interact. And uh, in Mendocino County, um, nowhere uh, is uh, this more apparent and may have already played out to some degree in the past uh, with humans. <clears throat> uh, Mendocino County historically uh, has experienced intensive timber harvesting uh, and much uh, of uh, the land had been cleared and, uh, and water courses um, were harvested through and not protected. Um, you know, for long periods of time, and this is starting in the 1800s with a bull team running up the gut of a, of a stream here, um, to road building in the 50s, to even clear cutting um, in the 1970s before the passage of the Forest Practices Act. And this is actually an area on MRC land now, uh, it's Wan Creek, it actually has tailed frogs in it. So the interesting thing about this too is that we don't know, we didn't know anything about the distribution of tailed frogs on this landscape, but yet it had already been harvested like this. It's just, we're doing things a little backwards. But <clears throat> well, we also know that uh, tailed frog range uh, in green, the coastal tailed frog range coincides with timber harvest activities throughout from north to south. And um, we can definitely say that tailed frogs do exhibit some degree of resilience to disturbance. Um, see that uh, with them coming back in Mount St. Helens and on um, a lot of these timberlands that have been over harvested um, um, for many, many years. And uh, like Hart talk uh, touched on was uh, that tailed frogs are known as, uh, by biologists as being bioindicators, meaning that if you go to a site and you find tailed frogs and you see them repeatedly occupying the site reproducing, that you can expect that there'll be some, a small set of conditions that you know pretty much be constant at those sites, um, such as perennial source of water, headwater stream, and often low and fine sediment, and have coarse gravel and cobble and low water temperatures. And the tailed frog is uh, has the narrowest thermal range of any stream-dwelling amphibian, and the eggs are particularly sensitive to uh, temperatures in excess of 18 and a half degrees Celsius. We look at the uh, range of the tailed frog here. Uh, we see there's gradients that move along north and south, um, <clears throat> north to south precipitation, and even east to west. And when we look down south, we see down here in Mendocino County that the range um, becomes extremely narrow. Let me just show you real quick. Uh, this is an example of some occupied habitat with uh, characteristic uh, coarse gravel and uh, cobble substrates. Um, here's a tailed frog here. And this is a male tailed frog with its uh, tail, say uh, an extension of its cloaca. And this is in uh, the non-breeding season, non-breeding condition. And here's a male in April um, that's in breeding condition uh, that we found. It's the only one we've seen on the landscape uh, in breeding condition. And um, again, the, this is the only frog that has, um, that copulates and has an intermittent organ and uh, has evolved this uh, reproductive strategy to ensure fertilization in fast-flowing uh, aquatic environments. Oops. Oh. Likewise, the tadpoles um, larvae are equally, uh, have evolved the ability to, uh, they have a large suctorial mouth and um, can, um, 
<clears throat> scrape periphyton from the rocks and also with that suctorial mouth um, live in swift water environments. So here's a detail of, uh, of one of the range maps uh, detailing its southern distribution in Mendocino County um, overlaid with uh, Mendocino Redwood Company timberlands. Um, well, let me back up here since you can't see the timberlands. So MRC, Mendocino Redwood Company timberlands um, uh, consist of 90,000 hectares of redwood, dug fir, tan oak forests, uh, primarily in Mendocino County. Um, the history of tailed frog observations um, show that Mendocino County has a lack of verifiable records in the few museum specimens ha it has. Um, if you look here, um, the specimen here, which is a dark gulch just north of the Albion River, was collected by Robert Stebbins in 1955. And there's just a few more localities uh, up here near Westport, and then up here at UC Angelo Preserve, um, the specimens collected in 1984 and 1985, uh, I think by heart. <clears throat> Start to look at uh, some of the uh, observations that are in the CNDDB that uh, showed up in the 1990s. Uh, so on GP lands then, it was the easternmost observation was on the Middle Fork 10 mile. And then in the early 2000s, uh, there were some observations that were entered into uh, the database for Jackson State State Parks. So there's just these handful of observations, yet there's all these maps that have been produced um, suggesting that the tailed frogs ranged all the way down to um, uh, south of Point Arena. In fact, uh, Robert Stebbins uh, and his field guide to Western reptiles and amphibians um, indicated that he thought the range extended to just near Anchor Bay, which is right there. <clears throat> so with this lack of knowledge, uh, you know, we realized that uh, we needed to go out and uh, provided the impetus to conduct some 19th century biology in the 21st century. So set out to document breeding distribution, um, looking for tailed streams that, uh, where tailed frogs are breeding. And this is to provide baseline data for long-term management and, and also for uh, data for public databases, such as the California Natural Diversity Database, and uh, voucher specimens to museums to substantiate uh, the range delineation within Mendocino County. Uh, a secondary aspect of the study um, was to identify factors associated with coastal tailed frog presence. Conducted uh, distribution surveys uh, starting in 2003 and finished them for the property in 2011. What we did is we identified survey sites uh, on maps in select planning watersheds every year. And the criteria that uh, we followed was that they, the sites had to be well distributed, have perennial flow, and be second or third order streams. Um, at each site, we conducted a 30-minute time-constrained search, meaning that uh, a survey was conducted until at least a larva was found or 30 minutes uh, had elapsed. <clears throat> so for the data, you can't uh, really see the MRC ownership on here, but uh, it's sort of outlined by the intense level of sampling. Um, we detected larvae at 82 of uh, 400 sites. And um, as you can see on the map, the sites with detections are the orange circles, and the sites that were surveyed with no detection are the black squares. This is covered 16. Uh, uh, occupancy was found in 16 of 59 planting watersheds. And the, upper, the easternmost uh, site was over here on Elk Creek, Upper Elk Creek. And the southernmost site is here. Uh, on Schooner Gulch, which was just south of Point Arena, and was just five miles northwest of where Stebbins had suggested their range ends. So maybe he knew something. I searched the MVC, searched his field notes, and I could not find uh, any documentation, anecdotes, that uh, uh, tailed frogs were ever seen down there. And David Wake had suggested, well, maybe he knew somebody down there that you know provided that information to him. <clears throat> We also did uh, some surveys down here in Annapolis. And another thing I wanted to say was that there is a uh, person by the name of Salt who produced a, uh, a document on the bell toad, is what they called it uh, back in the 50s. And he uh, speculated that uh, the tailed frogs 
may actually extend into northern uh, Sonoma, northern and central Sonoma County. But that was just speculation. Uh, so one way to think of range maps is they're just working hypotheses. And this is a, a range map uh, that was published in 2004 by Lanu and um, amphibian declines. And the point here is just that uh, our, to show overlay our surveys and that there's hypothetical edge areas that we surveyed. And there's also known gaps in survey coverage for the um, suggested range here. And MRC lands obviously doesn't cover the entire range of Mendocino County, but we think it, it offers a very good uh, representative sample because we have ownership north and south and then east and west. So we cover some environmental gradients. Uh, in 2013, uh, DFW um, published a, a revised range map and is in part based on um, our survey information and the release of the California uh, Amphibian Reptile Species of Special Concern document that came out in uh, June. And here I've, um, I've put all the uh, sites uh, with detections from MRC surveys and the CNDDB on there, as well as the uh, survey sites where uh, <clears throat> tailed frogs were not detected. And you can see on this map, there's also other hypothetical edge areas that are surveyed. There's some real noticeable uh, absence of, uh, from interior sites, most notably uh, here, and from some coastal areas like uh, the Albion. So after we finished the uh, first run on the distribution, uh, we wanted to ask the question, well, what are the conditions associated with larval presence? What we did was they uh, evaluated nine a priori hypotheses from uh, the published literature, and we used logistic regression and an information theoretic framework, and we had to make a lot of assumptions with this analysis. Uh, we collected data for 12 variables, and they're listed there in white, and those uh, the variables listed in white correspond with variables um, that were uh, in, the, uh, in the published literature. Uh, we also looked wanted to look at another variable distance from coast, distance from the coast, and that was done in a post hoc analysis. So our, our preliminary results, um, well, what did it say? Well, surprise, surprise, it's all about temperature and dirt, stupid. <clears throat> and we found, uh, we found that there were two of the nine models were infor informative. And I'm just listing here, they were all, uh, they all had five parameters in them, uh, but the interesting thing about them is that uh, water temperature and embeddedness appeared to be uh, driving the model selection process and that their parameter estimates, uh, their confidence intervals didn't overlap zero. So I know I'm dismissing the other variables that in the model, but I'm just trying to find some major drivers here um, that might be at play. And another thing we note that, that uh, we do a lot of water temperature monitoring on the landscape. And we know that there's a relationship between water temperature and distance from the coast. So we wanted to see, well, what if we went ahead and substituted distance from coast for water temperature and include that in the top two best models and then create a two-parameter model with embeddedness and distance from the coast. And the result of that improved model performance and ranking. So what do we say about that? Well, the coastal influence is strong. And with this map, on the right uh, depicts here. Um, these are a listing of all of our um, uh, water temperature monitoring stations, and they're color coded for temperature. And here we calculate uh, maximum weekly average, te average temperatures. And you see that the majority of your blue sites, which are the lowest temperatures, um, are along the coast. And as you progressively move inland, um, they get uh, warmer and warmer and get to the point where you have more of the red stations, which represent you're approaching the physiological tolerance of um, tailed frogs for their eggs. So water temperature was negatively associated with coastal tailed frog presence, and we conclude that um, this, is a, this is a limiting factor for their inland distribution in Mendocino County. And another thing to note is, again, thinking back to what I started out on, on the presentation was all this harvesting that occurred, we often wonder in these areas here, if there were any tailed frogs. I mean, it seems plausible that in a primary forest that the conditions could be just made more suitable for them and that the removal of those forests somehow, somehow tipped the balance. But at this point, until we find tailed frogs in this area, we'll never be able to answer that question. 
And then another thing is that, again, the distance from the coast obviously served as a great surrogate um, for water temperature in this now analysis. And that's due to this, this really narrow band. Might not work in other areas. And this, again, superimposing the uh, locations where tailed frogs are found in the, in the county over the water temperature, it's obvious correlation. Again, uh, we also found that, uh, like much like Hart's research, um, that uh, embeddedness was negatively related to coastal tailed frog presence. And again, it's an indicator of suitable larval habitat. Um, where you have lower embeddedness, you have more interstitial spaces, um, more areas for uh, tailed frog larvae to, um, um, to feed and to find refugia from predators and also high flows. And one of the things that we have to go back and look at is that we seem to think that embeddedness may have been more of a factor within uh, occupied watersheds sheds, and indicating there may be uh, an issue with legacy issues on some of our streams. <clears throat> so um, the tailed frog, it's a, it's a species on the edge of its range. Um, the southern extent uh, verified closer to Anchor Bay. However, uh, surveys needed, uh, there are more surveys needed near Wallala and northern Sonoma County. And that's going to be a collaborative effort because, you know, the majority of these areas are privately owned and not all the landowners, um, you know, necessarily cooperate on these things. But as I recall, uh, Matt going knocking on doors down there for to ask people, and a lot of people actually will allow you onto their land. <clears throat> Another thing is uh, the research here uh, shows that the eastern extent uh, may be smaller than current range maps depict. And again, the obvious uh, distribution is tied to regional temperature patterns, which um, are heavily influenced by proximity to the coast. Uh, and another important thing that we're going to continue to do is to do uh, annual distribution monitoring um, because with climate change and warming scenarios, this is where you're likely to see the populations of tailed frogs make a, you know, a shrink in the south and go north. <clears throat> and of course, also looking at some of our streams from the extended uh, drought period. <clears throat> So with that, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors who did um, all of the uh, all of the field work, and uh, funding was provided by a Habitat Planning Conservation Assistance Grant from the Fish and Wildlife Service to the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, dispersed to Mendocino Redwood Company, as well as Mendocino Redwood Company for supporting the project for nine years and continuing, and also thank the various agencies that provided the uh, GIS. Uh, files that I used in the presentation, so. Thank you, Robert. We have time for a couple questions. Anybody has? Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's sort of weird that the surrogate for water temperature was a better predictor than just water temperature. Right. And so what do you think the coastal distance from coastal well, capturing is that? Well, um, well, there's a couple of things. There's also analysis probes. So we used our hydro station. So not all, there were not water temperature probes at every sur survey site. So we had to make some assumptions with that. We have a lot of temperature probes, so we had to assign and basically pseudo-replicate some data, which you have to do with uh, climate data sometimes, to sites based on proximity within the watershed. And so that was a potential information loss there. Um, <clears throat> but another thing is, is that um, I think that if you had air temperature and water temperature uh, probes at a site, you may have to th you use one or the other because they will be too intercorrelated, okay? But you can think distance from the coast is kind of a, a one-dimensional metric that captures elements of air temperature and water temperature simultaneously. One more? Well, you know, Robert, what I really appreciate is recognizing the value of basic natural history research for these woefully understudied species. I mean, just to get the groundwork done, it's good stuff. So thank you. Thank you very much.